Welcome back, gamers and gay mats. It's your boys, Lecce and Daniel from 5 4 <laughs> back on the cast, right into Pro Draft. But before then, I gotta ask him, Danielson, how are you doing today? It's been a while. Ah, uh, you know, it has been a very good week for me, but I am happy to be here today, and I'm happily observing some high-quality League of Legends, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Yeah, already, we see the Olaf coming out as the first ban, and SAU taking away Ash after the recent Caitlyn and Ooh. Senna bans. Ash has pretty much been that last remaining S-plus tier ADC as well. Hecarim on the red side. Sometimes you feel like you have to ban it or Shen, because if blue side manages to get that combo, it is just so, so dirty. Oh yeah, absolutely. A lot of power picks right here. And back to what you mentioned in the bottom. And like you said, we had that Caitlyn Ash meta for the longest time right here. We have gotten several nerfs in a row right there on that Caitlyn actually. But seeing the Ash band out, really, really epic stuff. We still have Jin. We still have uh, Senna. You know, both open right now. She did just get a nerf, but I still think she's very strong. I've even been seeing some both Kogma and Varus pop back Ooh. up in the meta. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Yeah, Varus from the lowest or highest win rate AD by like 3% to the lowest win rate by AD, AD uh, by like 3%. <laughs> You're talking about how the Shen Hecarim combo is so dirty, but even without Hecarim, Shen is just such a strong champ right now in the top lane. Oh, yeah, definitely. And he doesn't even have to go into the top lane. He can be flexed there into that River Shen. We saw from TSM Ooh. in the finals right there, and we haven't seen any changes uh, on my Ninja Boy here uh in the past a few patches you know he's still just as strong honestly his damage is insane it kind of just seems bugged sometimes how good it is yeah and considering he's practically unkillable as well it's just i agree with you it's absurd but mm -hmm. despite the recent nerfs sau have decided to bust out the caitlin a lot of people are saying that that kind of may have gutted her but at the end of the day if you're still a good team playing around siege comps caitlin is the ad carry for you yeah you know i think they nerfed like three base ad off that champion right which you know, that is a lot, right? But, you know, just auto attack once more in lane and you'll just get that, right? It's She's still the same champion. She still has insane range, uh, wave clear. Ooh, and set up with that Morgana, Caitlyn Morgana. Very, I've, I've very got formidable to go. in the bot lane. I've got to Let's go on a little bit of a tangent. Caitlyn Morgana, it's El Clasico, really lane dominant, yada, yada, yada. But early picking it in drafts is just so, so susceptible to counterplay. You can yep. pick Lux into it and just not let Morgana do what she wants to do. Lux, yep. uh, really any mage, and she just stops being a champion, and you get to take control of that bot lane. But MU, pick up a Kali, another high priority of pick, as well as the Jin, one of those few really mm. kind of counter pick ADs that we've seen popping up more and more. Yeah, you know, in the bot lane, Morgana is very good into a lot of engaged sort of champions, though, into the Alistair, Nautilus. She's overpowered, right? But she really doesn't have enough force in her kit to really hit back against a lot of the, like, powerful mage or champions. You know, you can pick Lulu into it, you can pick Karma into it, or like you said, you can pick really any kind of mage. So, and it's a, it's a powerful combo, and you know, if you're practiced on it, go for it. But there are better picks right there. But Orn to Shen, that's a matchup I'm looking forward to. You like that tank versus tank matchup, my man? Normally, I, I, I hate tank versus tank matchups. Just watching them proc grass back and forth is the most boring thing in the world. But Orn and Shen aren't just tanks. They're also carries because for whatever reason, these two tanks deal massive amounts of damage, particularly oh, yeah. max health, which against each other is so, so valuable. So this tank matchup is actually going to be pretty volatile in the top side as we're talking about how strong the bottom side of the map will be for SAU as they pick Caitlyn Morgana. So you got to have a weak side top to go along with that. And Orn and Shen are really the only two that are very viable in the meta right now, maybe Scion and some fringe uh, places. So seeing mm -hmm. SAU pick up the Orn here isn't the most surprising thing in the world. And here they're going to have to blind pick either their mid or jungle. So we're probably seeing a jungle pick come out that's why mu bans the cannon set yeah we saw four jungle bans well technically four if you include the set uh coming out of this second ban phase so i would in general go for a jungle pick right here you know we do have a lot of picks still up when we have the olaf we have a lot more fringe picks as well uh, but it looks like it's actually the mid lane Ooh. picked up here for sau cassiopeia strong champion indeed yeah, I like Cassiopeia into low interaction range compositions, because if nobody can get onto Cassio when she's first kind of stacking up in these fights, she is pretty much invincible. She just starts oh, yeah. moving at the speed of a dash, and if you can't get onto her, you just die. The Definitely. only issue is, there's a lot of champions in the game who do just outrange her. Like, even Trundle Pillar uh, mm. can kind of screw a Cassiopeia over, and Ooh. Syndra does come out. Now, if Cassio gets caught by a single scat of the week, this is kind of that interaction range I was talking about. If she ever walks too close to Skindra, Syndra, 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 all that scatter is up, 
then Cassio is just going to pretty much get insta-killed, but Jin Karma is going to be the bot lane this game. Very likely that Shen jungle you were talking about. Yeah, definitely. I gotta say, we saw the Akali, and seeing the Syndra picked up does confirm that it's gonna be a top lane Akali. Probably haven't seen any Akali jungle, I don't know if you have, but the Shen <laughs> jungle actually going to pick up for MU. And yeah, definitely gonna have a skill matchup here in the mid lane. But yeah, bot lane, going for that Jin Karma into the cave, Morgan. I think that's a very, very good matchup for you. But Graves is actually gonna be the final pickup for SAU. Definitely uh, gonna have a pretty good time against the Shen, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think early levels, Graves is just going to be able to out-duel him. Uh, mm. It's kind of old news now, but just being able to take Phase Rush is so powerful in this champ. He just gets so much early dueling power. Um, a lot of junglers will just straight up late invade with Sweeper level 1, and they just win every single fight. Um, so seeing this Graves come out, definitely been a high-priority carry jungle recently. Paired with the Orn and specifically the Cassiopeia, I really like as well. Because Graves does not have a lot of gank set up, so making sure that that exists in each lane in the form of a Miasma, just Orn existing, or like Morgana, I think is really, really big for SAU's lanes. And this is something weird. I kind of want to point towards how these compositions are going to end up working. Graves is going to be spending a lot of time, I think, on the bottom sides of the map, playing around this Caitlyn Morgana, Cassiopeia, looking for early dragons, which is not something that Shen very easily takes. So I think if SAU managed to get those early drags, then the game is, their game plan will just be pretty flawless. So it'll be up to MU and Shen's kind of global map pressure to somehow try and mitigate that. Definitely, I completely agree. You know, uh, I think if you're Graves in this kind of a matchup, you try to go for an early kind of invade, you know, take the red buff away from that Shen and split the map so you get to spend all your time on the bottom half uh, for your team. You know, get that dragon pressure, pressure for your bot lane. You know, you already have the Morgana set up for the ganks. Why not get the jungle there as well? However, if you do do that, I think I did say doo-doo. Uh, Akali <laughs> into Orn, I think, is going to be a very interesting matchup right here. We have the carry top laner. A lot of damage, you know, Akali is an extremely feared in that soul lane, especially once she hits six, probably one of the best single item power spikes in the game with that gun blade. Uh, Shen can potentially get her going. He's very good with ganks with his taunt and or really doesn't have that many tools to get away from the gank. So I definitely think that that should be the play split in the map here from Graves, but that does leave your top side. You know, you're gonna have to play weak and luckily Orn is a champion that skills very well with levels. You know, you don't have to get every single minion to be useful, but I think we've got some cool League of Legends to be playing today. Yeah, I mean, just the first two picks, Shen and Akali, that just makes the game, for me personally, a lot more exciting to see. Because although Shen, even in jungle, can be kind of sleeper, the Stand United just empowers every single member of your team to be looking for more fights. Like, Akali, I fully expect her, just like in a 1v2 or uh, 2v3, to just jump in because she knows that mm. no matter where you're on the map, Shen has her back. And you can just instantly Stand United and oh, suddenly... Yeah. It's a 3v3, or 3v3, 3v3. Um, as well, I think MU have a lot more kind of kite ability. So if Cassio doesn't manage to get a good stun or Miasma, or if SAU don't really catch somebody out, then the Karma speed ups, the Syndra peel, um, the, just every, the fact that Akali has four dashes and Shen has a pretty long one, it, it could be an issue if SAU don't manage to pick the right fights. That being said, they have Ornn. That's probably the easiest team fight tool in the game. It's just practically half your screen and you get to use it twice. So oh. a lot of it, <laughs> a lot of it, I do think is going to come down to like what you're talking about. It's kind of early mid games, how much top ends up falling and how well Orn can play this weaker side, but also how Caitlyn Morgana can really, you know, excel and push out this Jin Karma if they even can. Yeah, you know, I completely agree. We have a lot of interesting matchups here in this game and a lot of more to play off of here in pressure. I think it's at times like this that I do like to bring up the, ah, it's kind of a weird way of saying it, but the individual skill of the players. Uh, over on the side of MU, we have some very high diamond players. We got D2 there on Scuzz right on his Kali in the top lane. What an epic player right there. And a lot of power across the map and rank. Whereas on the side of SAU, you know, a lot of these players are gold. You know, I, I don't want to flame or anything, but that does mean you have a little bit less mastery over your champion. Your champion pool is a little bit more constricted. And there are some things like wave control, uh, roaming to jungle fights earlier that I think you kind of miss out on. So I do really like the draft way more from SAU, but whether or not they're actually able to follow up on it and really play it out correctly has yet to be seen. It's kind of like uh, we got the underdogs over here at SAU. I'll say it. Yeah, I, I agree. And it, when you're highest ranked player, you know, Neko 
on this Caitlyn is a plat player. So when your highest ranked player is on this lane strong side dominant champion, oh yeah, that definitely that definitely bodes well for you. There could be an issue as we reach the mid game and some of these uh, some of these midland champions start to come online, like the Syndra, like the Akali. Uh, even the Jin, and when Caitlyn is in that big, you know, power slump in her V power curve, then that's when I think there will be an issue for SAU being able to get those third and fourth dragons and wrap up their early mid game with you know just a nice tight bow in the form of that dragon soul is going to be huge for them. As we are going to be getting into the ch client champion select here and seeing exactly where everything is going. I don't expect that many mix ups. That being said. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying it's going to happen. Sentra jungle is probably like my second favorite jungle to play. Only second to Morgana jungle, so grave uh, support uh, uh, could be on the table. We I just don't know. Don't man. Know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do want to ask you about this though. You're talking about the the power curse here on the ADCs. Like, at what points of the game do you think Caitlyn is stronger than the Jin? And when would you say Jin is stronger? How do you think that matchup really goes? So. Definitely at first item, when both pick up the IE, maybe Jin decides on a Storm Razor. When both pick up their first item, Caitlyn's going to be stronger, like at item boots. But at two okay. items, Jin is definitely going to uh, just kind of have more, even value in a lot of these fights. Because Caitlyn really is in that kind of after. Caitlyn's great because, okay. like in solo queue, she's fantastic because you get to lane kingdom and you get to obliterate like 18 fights. But her issue comes in that mid game kind of, you know, 20 to 30 minute minute, 20 minute to 30 minute mark, where she is at those two items, like IE Storm Razor or IE and crit item, whether it's Essence Reaver or Zeal. So a lot of it, I think, is going to be once Jin gets his IE Rapid Fire or IE um, Storm Razor, that's when Jin is just going to be popping off. Mm. Um, but once they get to three, four items, Jin pretty much starts to take a utility pose. So at that point, Caitlyn's running the show for her team, and he just is kind of supporting the Syndra Akali. Okay, okay, you know, that is fair. It's not too bad of a team to support. Either way, we are waiting on the loadout right here. We're going to get into that Spectre delay here in about 45 seconds. And I got to ask you, man, I know my answer because I am the color caster. I'm the smart one. But uh, <laughs> based solely off of these team comps, who do you think is coming away with this game one? Well, I think as soon as we hit 20 seconds, I'm going to have my answer. Because Daniel said, <laughs> Syndra Jungle is just so good here. And if there's no Syndra Jungle, I'm have to going to go SAO. Well, there oh. we go. As much okay. as I love Shen Jungle, Syndra Jungle's my jam. Uh, I think that SAU are hard outclassed just in terms of individual like player skill. Every single lane uh, is outclassed in terms of rank. However, I think they drafted pretty well around that, giving their highest ranked player a strong side bottom and their lowest ranked player a weak side top, I think is pretty strong. I still think that Midland are going to be the ones who take this game pretty handily because I think they're going to be able to win that early game. However, if there is a game that SAU can win, it's going to be this one. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, however, I do got to say, you know, we do have the weak side top. We do have uh, winning bottling over there for SAU, but... I really just like the chances a little bit more on MU. You know, I love seeing, seeing the Shen jungle coming out. I think it's a very underrated oh, yeah. pick, potentially one that you can survive pretty handily into Graves and just be more useful there, both uh, mid and late game, particularly once you get your six. I really do believe in uh, Skuz Ratsakali to pop off in this game, and I think we're definitely be watching a lot uh, of that top side here in this game. Either way, that's my predictions. Any other final notes you have before we get into the spectator delay map? I, I think Scuzz Rat and Killer Guy made lane swap. They did it literally every game that we've casted them. And I, I would not be surprised if Syndra ended up going to off for who knows what reason. Don't think it's the right call, but it very well could happen. So keep your eyes on that. But that is going to be it from us as we wrap up and work through this spectator delay to get the actual game set up. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this lightning fast break.
Welcome back to Midland University Warriors. Lecce and Danielson at it again. As we load into this game, we get a little bit of a clearer view of everything that, uh, you know, all these champions, what they've chosen as their keystone rune. Danielson, oh, yeah. something, something standing out to me here on the blue side. Really? Uh, you know, I did notice a little something, you know. Uh, we do have that press the attack Shen, but I think the bigger story here is that Conqueror Jin, uh, chosen for the... Uh, bottom half of uh, MIGU. And, you know, I'm just looking and I'm just wondering, do you think he's ever going to get a Conqueror proc this game? You know, they, <laughs> you need 12 procs to fully stack it, right? Range champions get one proc for auto attack and I think two for hitting an ability. And I'm just like, all right, if he hits the W and the Q, that's four procs, he's still going to have to auto attack eight times to get that Conqueror proc. It's just like, this is a gin, man. What are you doing? <laughs> kind of ridiculous if you ask me yeah I, I i completely agree i think he may have been playing samira last game that would explain oh. a few things um but that being said this is kind of monkey as we are going to get into game heckles already being zoned off of this midwave orbit it's taking the long way he believes in the shen to just not get taken down by these jungle camps and kind of like what you're talking about the pta shen this is one of the runes of choice for jungle shen because you're not going to be proccing grasp that often you're not really going to oh, be proccing yeah. aftershock that often so going pta for that dueling power on a champion that already has a deceptively high amount of damage with that max health damage and attack speed on the uh spirit sword uh is you know kind of what a lot of these jungle shens are going you can see him actually looking like he's going to go for a level three path buff to buff to grom Ooh. maybe look for something early on the top side yeah i definitely really like that here from the shen uh, of course you're going for something like that Basically, the uh, the resolve tree not very strong for most junglers. Like I get, if you want the aftershock, you're playing something like the Ramus, that's great and all, but it's going to slow down your clear. You know, with precision, you get that additional attack speed, you get a uh, just a lot more tools to be working with right there. Really, really great stuff. But yeah, going for that level three, going for a little bit of early influence top is, I think, you definitely want that. Uh, ooh, we have a little fight here, Balin. Yeah, Balloon Pants is getting chunked out. We were talking in Champion Select about how, yeah, Morgana Caitlyn's great, but if you get a mage picked into you. Morgana pretty much stops being uh, a good or destroying lane. <laughs> Her black shield disappears. Maybe you're a binding bot, but at that case, uh, you've kind of lost a lot of the essence of the champion. So being able to just pick Karma into this, like B4, is so, so huge. More mm -hmm. Pop in orbit in the bottom lane. And look, they are pushing in Caitlyn Karma, or uh, not Caitlyn Karma, but Caitlyn Morgana early on. That's so antithetical to what that lane wants to do. I completely agree. You know, you pick Caitlyn, you want to shove in the lane, get those tower plantings, and just be a monster for the first 10, 15 minutes of the game. Like you said, 20 to 30, you have a little bit of a power drop, but once you get all those items, you're going to be pretty freaking epic. But uh, yeah, getting pushed in is going to mean your jungler is losing cryo, like we are seeing right there. It's going to be boarded up, and you're not really not going to be able to get too much influence there uh, from Nate Mac on that grave. It's really, really bad uh, for this kind of matchup. However, did we see Shane gank, Shen gank top at all? I don't think we saw that. At all no, game. he took he took Graze's Krugs, so he did a little Ooh. bit of counter jungling on that path because Orin is a uh, Scuzz Rat's been pushing in Orin this whole time, but Tractor's not even taking the top scuttle. He's actually just going to look to take this right from under oh. him, and he does. This could be positioning for, for the double scuttle now. Nate Max 17's running away gets hit by the Jin root, but he's just going to walk away. Nice miasma comes out from Peckles. Yeah, really, really great stuff here from these guys. Tractor should not be winning this kind of a matchup right here. The fact that he's able to just walk up, take that scuttle. I thought it was it would be kind of funny if he just smited it away, but no one had smite, <laughs> and Graves just gives it up. You know, he, the auto attack Q uh, from Shen, just too much power. And it is going to mean double scuttle coming over here for the Shen. A lot more gold to be working with right here. And, you know, he, he, uh, not looking too good for Nate Nack on this Graves so far, I got to say. No, not at all. Now, Peckles has, you know, used their QE combo once or twice, so the mid laner now has no mana over on SAU, but Scuzzrat is looking to extend this trade, forces mm. out the flash from Defleegs. This means that Tractor is, after probably clearing a little bit of his jungler basing and coming back with a bomby cinder, is going to be looking at that top side of the map because, uh -oh. oh, he doesn't even back. He's just waiting in the bush, but Defleegs knows that Shen hasn't backed or walked too far away because the spirit sword's just kind of chilling. Uh, so maybe a little bit of 
yeah. uh, you know, hasn't practiced the champ too much. Um, but now that Shen is in such a great position, and he can maybe even look to try and get this early drag and ruin SAU's plans, Tractors has just had a lot of impact this game without dropping down below one or two games. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. This is a lot more influence over the game than Shen should have. Then realistic early. Uh, we do have the Negatron Globe picked up for Orn pretty early against the Akali. I really would have liked to see a uh, a Spirit, not the Spirit Fissage item. What's it called? The blue one? Spectre's Cal. Spectre's Cal. Thank you, man. Uh, picked up early for this guy. Very effective at champions who throw a lot of stuff at you and really uh, question whether or not they want to go in based on your health pool. Uh, but getting the Negatron Globe is pretty good in the all in. Of course, it does build into that Abyssal Mask. So. You know, maybe it's best for him. Either way, we are seeing 37 CS to 34 in that top lane. Relatively even across the map, except in the bot lane, where it's 42 to 31 in favor of that Jin. Really not what Caitlyn wants to be working with here. No, not at all. Like we mentioned earlier, this is just so against why you're picking Caitlyn Morgana. I mean, if you're going to have a losing lane with this, just, I don't know, pick Sivir or something. Uh, oh, yeah. But now, we were talking earlier about how Tractors may be looking for this first dragon. He's already on it, using that bot lane and mid lane shove that he's got. This is just, he's going to get this for free, but Balloon Pats and Neko. If you're looking for something here, the Binding does connect onto Karma. Here's all of that headshot damage. This is just so much. I think she's got another one, but she's not in range. Graves takes Orbit down pretty substantially. This headshot actually may take him out, but a nice scatter and a snare from Jin. Jin balloon Press may just be taking down Tractors with the Flash Taunt. First Blood goes over the Killer Guy. Now some TPs coming in. Scuzzrad using that first part of the perfect execution. Or getting a double knockup in a huge petrifying days coming out from Cassiopeia. Killer Guy may be cut out, but Scuzzrat is here to deliver all of the damage his team needs using that Karma Shield to just mock tenet in. Jin with the flash fourth auto. Down goes Peckles. Now Neko as well may be caught out. <laughs> Mac, this fight is extending so long and it's looking better and better for Midland U. The Killer Guy gets the second kill of his game. Ooh. And this fight has been all over the place. Initially, SAU, they just didn't want to give up this dragon, and it looked pretty good for them. But some massive teleports, Tractors decided to take one for the team and sacrifice himself to make sure that uh, I believe Nate Mac would get taken down. So big plays early on for, for Midland, 4-2-1 with a 2k gold lead at 7 minutes. Yeah, such an insane play over here from MUDU. And I gotta say, that really looked like a SAU's fight. Uh, before this one right here. Eventually they are, they got such a good combo right there uh, with that Orn and Cassiopeia ultimate. However, they're not able to finish off any of those kills and eventually it's just going to be Shen getting a taunt followed up with that Cassia, Jin popping off with the damage and Akali just creating so much space uh, with that threat of damage from her. Ultimately it's going to be 4 to 1 uh, in the favor of MIDU and they are working with some power right now. They really are. The Syndra picked up her lost chapter. Akali started to buy items. Sodi Pop got a BF Sword and a Pickaxe, so he is feeling really nice. Even without, even with Conquer, you know he's still going to be packing some damage. And now Scuzzrat and Defleas are just dueling it on in the top lane. Orn versus Akali. Orn wins the trades. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Just a crazy champ, but um, so far Scuzzrat, when he hasn't been able to pressure top lane, he has just decided to look for these extra plays down in the jungle, down in the bottom lane. And now that Dragon's been taken out, that means both of these junglers have turned their attention, to attention top side, where Tractor's currently up in levels. He has the stand united, Nate Mac doesn't. So Shen has so much more freedom on the map to go where he, go where he needs to go and still have pressure on this Rift Herald towards the mid lane, towards the top lane. Yeah, absolutely. Just really creating so much pressure with that kind of a pick. And you really would have hoped Graves be a little bit further behead right, ahead right now. Not 0-1-1 one one with a double longsword and a skirmisher saber right now. It really interesting, though. We are seeing longsword pick up from Shen. I think that he's going to build the team out. I doubt we're going to see the warrior Shen. However, that would be pretty spicy if we did. Oh, that would be so spicy. But sadly, this will just probably be Tiamat, you know, helping him with the wave clear, ah. I guess. Uh, but he he's actually just taking Rift Herald right now. Nink Mac is trying to get back something in Shen's bottom side jungle, but Raptors are down, and he's in second to look for something mid. Killer Guy still has scatter, but no knocks back. Beckles, the petrifying gaze doesn't connect, and that means Killer Guy just gets to walk away. Uh. And now Nate Mac just is in such a bad position as the bottom lane starts winning as well. Sodi Pop and Orbit are just not letting Neko and Balloon Pants play this game. 
that devil. That was just so much damage in a combo for free right there uh, against that Caitlyn. Getting three procs or three kills with that gin grenade and then getting a proc onto the AD carry, that really shouldn't be happening. You should be positioning a little bit differently uh, for that one. Now, at the time like this, I would like to talk a little bit about the mid lane builds right now. We are seeing uh, the tier picked up. On the Cassiopeia, P, of course, builds into that Saras versus Lost Chapter first item from that Singe. Of course, she could choose to build that uh, tier into that Saras for herself. But what it's mean is a little bit more early power to be working with in that Ludens Echo. You know, I assume it would be the Ludens. I have seen a lot of people on Twitter saying that a uh, GLP is just way better. Hey, than GLP fan club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if we do see that, uh, oh, the major root respect. connects. Uh oh. Sony Pop. He, he has all. He has curtain call, so he could try yeah. and look for an angle here if he really wants to. I would. <laughs> yeah. Sody Pop, just a little more passive of a player, not as cool as you, Danielson. Nah, whatever. Anyway, yeah, the, the thing about the Jin Ultimate, it really does not do that much damage. So if you can ever get the uh, the chance to sort of use it to like maybe poke out the enemy or threaten to kill or basically force them to back, you're getting a lot of value that way. One other thing I like to talk about is uh, ooh, fight here in the top lane. Do I get to talk? Nah, I, I, get, I, get, to, I get to talk. That's or he's not gonna die. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, with the Jin ultimate, I see a lot of people in team fights uh, using that ultimate really immediately. Jin does a lot more damage, both with his uh, Q, W, and uh, just regular auto attacks in team fights than you do with your ultimate. It's really not that high value on ultimate. It's much better used for the slow as sort of a re engage in kind of team fights than actually your source of DPS as Jin. Really just cuts off that champion. And when you're sitting at 88 CS to 59 against the Caitlyn oh game, I sure hope you don't see that in game. Yeah, Sody Pop and Orbit have just been running this lane 20 CS up. They might even just be forsaking this wave because they want Dragon Control. Infernal is up 11 and a half minutes into the game. Echo and Balloon Pants are looking for something. Meat Mac is here as well. So is Shen. He doesn't even want to wait for maybe having to use the stand united he just wants this dragon as soon as possible so they're clearing out vision looking for a pick looking for something as this war does get spotted out so Chad just oh, is gonna take it out you see oh, what i'm seeing more the cedric dp ah not just that look at her build it's the glp yeah Hell this yeah, is dude. huge so if you're talking about a one item power spike in these team fights specifically GOP is going to be insane because Syndra is not even going to have to land a scatter to just practically CC the entire enemy frontline if not team. So if this early dragon skirmish does go down, GLP is going to be a lot more effective there. However, if this just become just becomes a pushing battle between Packles and Killer Guy, then Loons will start to show. But Scuzzrat's looking for something. He's going to go right back in. Perfect execution out. Thought he could get to the distance on the way out against Orn. Ooh. Now he has to flash. Great Ornhorn from to Fleegs, but he's too low health to look for this TP play. He doesn't have Ornhorn anymore, so this second dragon of the game is going to go over to Midland University. That means against a comp that we were talking about needs these first two dragons before they get into their power slump. Uh, the first two dragons have gone and went, and neither of them went to SAU. Yeah, definitely. I gotta say, like... Things were looking very good for SAU if they were able to get that early objectives. Obviously, you have superior late game scaling, both with that Kaelin and with those Orn items in the later half of the game. You know, but the fact that they're able to just take those things off the map and they really should have been yours with that Graves jungle speaks just so illy uh, to how they're playing this one out, right? This should have been their kind of objectives early. Oh, we seeing some kind of fight here or anything? Killer guy, he has ult. He can just walk up, Q, even if it's not on Peckles, probably ult and kill the Cassiopeia. But he decides to take his yeah. time, push it in the wave. And now Namak is looking for something to punish him. But Peckles keeps trying to walk through this choke. You just can't do that against Syndra. The ultimate's going to go through. Ooh. He didn't even need an extra ball. And Cassio just goes down. King was trying to provide some value. But here oh. is Shen with the Stain United. Namak's in lower and lower. Double Ooh. kill going over to... Oh, going over to Killer Guy. Now to Fleegs and Neko. This was going to be a 2v4. But now it's looking the exact other way. Scuzzrat's uh -oh. looking for something he uses. The Shroud might have just get chunked out, though. As soon as he goes into vision, yeah, Scuzzrat. A little bit of a yikes there. But the fight's going to extend. <laughs> and so far, it is still in Midland use favor that that play was insane from killer guy and tractors they just completely outplayed well specifically that press r was an insane outplay but also uh. <laughs> how they kind of moved around the mid lane there uh was very impressive nate mac and peckles ended up getting taken down 
Yeah, you know, uh, Phase Rush is a very powerful keystone. The positioning tools that you get is honestly just insane. I remember on the old runes, I think we're on runes or forge right there, but when they updated to make keystones first a thing, it took people a while, but they slowly realized that Storm Raider Surge was just like one of the best runes uh, in the game. You know, junglers started taking it, mid laners started taking it. I know Rise, probably one of the best uses of it back then, but I think slowly it kind of just feels like people are starting to realize that phase rush it provides basically the exact same usage as storm raider surge is also extremely good on picks like the syndra and uh, several champions who otherwise wouldn't really have that many good positioning tools yeah we we see how effective it is in these skirmishes and it's only going to really help her extend her lead in this lane now four and out gets an mm -hmm. 0 two casio who doesn't even have a fully completed item they got archangel staff that thing isn't a complete until it's upgraded in my book oh yeah so just practically like half an item and some change with the amplifying tone now scuzzrat just going in in oh. the top and completely looking for this trade is use the first part of the execution it's not going to look to extend the fleegs ends up getting chunked pretty heavily out of lane but it's orn you can't really kill that guy from full health, doesn't matter who yeah. you are. Uh, but Akali just looking to get some pressure in this top lane, maybe looking for, you know, some kind of angles. This Rift Herald comes up, a uh -oh. huge scatter comes out from Syndra. There we see the GLP, Petrifying Gaze does not collect, Killer Guy dodges it. He has unleashed power, and he's going to go for it. Down goes Pagles, just instant annihilation point and click. Oh, definitely, definitely. You know, when you get someone to about a third HP there on that center, nothing's more satisfying than hitting that R. Luckily, there's no barrier or anything available on that Cassia Pia. I do think Cleanse was definitely the correct choice in here, especially into that Shen, into the CC. That's pretty relatively easy to hit on that Syndra. But yeah, looking at 0-3 and 1 right now, you really just hope that she plays a little bit safer. I really would like to see maybe... Uh, Ruby Crystal or something coming out here onto this Cassiopeia rather than that blasting one and amplifying zone she's building right now. I think that, uh, what do you think she's building that? Is she going uh, for Leandre's or is she going for that, uh, uh, Rally's Crystal Scepter first? What do you think we're going to see? I, I don't know, but either way, I think I definitely agree. Health is probably the right call. Your killer guy may have taken off. Ooh. The she was Orn. He's just going to one to him, and down goes Syndra. Massive shutdown goes into the pocket of Orn, but he could be in trouble. Here comes Nate Mac, though. He's looking for extension on this play. A colleague gets knocked up under the turret range. In goes Tractors. He's trying to do something, and down goes Nate Mac. Here's Peckles. As a colleague just decides she wants this fight. Peckles doesn't have the petrifying gaze. Can look for it, but he doesn't even use it. Or he did as he was dying. Now Scuzzrat is looking for oh. even more. He comes to Stand United onto a colleague. Tractors is here to extend this play even longer, but Balloon Pants doesn't want it, just uses those chains of corruption, and down goes Scuzzrat again, you know, paying for his sins of overextending in fight after fight, he does get taken down, but an overall two for two, I believe. Yeah, I thought that uh, Tractors on the Shen was going to go in as well. You know, they're definitely strong enough with the, both the buffs that they have and the fact that they're both ahead of their respective opponents, you know, level 10 versus level 8 in the jungle matchup to potentially 2v2 the uh, bottom lane uh, from SAU, but it just looks like Shen, uh, who I think his taunt was on cooldown, did not want it, and Akali is just going to end up running into that bush and dying to that Morgana, and the auto attacks from Caitlyn. Let's talk about some of these builds right now. Caitlyn does have her Storm Razor, pretty good first item, but the Infinity Edge and the BF Sword and a Dagger coming out for Jin. This man is going to be popping a little bit harder than Caitlyn is in these fights. The end. As this next dragon comes up, a critical dragon for both teams. Mm -hmm. Her dragon is just so important. I honestly like it. It's probably my favorite dragon in the game because skirmishing around third dragon shows so much about what you prioritize as a team. And SAU definitely prioritizes it. They're already burning at Scuzzrat. I feel looking for the steal. So is Jin. They're trying to save up that fourth shot. Yes, Mike, though. He's going to do it, but at 72 health. That was way too close. Balloon Pants has to flash out of there. Nate Mac as well just dashes over the wall, tries to escape, and the Fleeks, he's caught out, but it's Orn. He's probably not going to die here, but Peckles and Nico, you can't say the same. Scuzzrat's going in, going to burst down. Peckles, Petrifying Gaze does not land again. Come on, dude, you got to get something here. Neko Ooh. goes down, Scuzzrat, but the Shuriken Flip doesn't connect onto Balloon Pants. Killer Guy is looking to try and get something in this play, using just all those Dark Spheres to get as much damage out as possible. And although they don't get the Dragon, they extend their gold lead. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like you were talking about, Third Dragon, one of the most important dragons of the game. It provides a lot of soul pressure if you had those first two dragons and you're able to get that one. Or it's the one where you use to turn around the game, start saying, hey, we're the ones with the goldies. We're going to start uh, making the BD plays here in this one. But unfortunately, they do not have the goldie. They just got the dragon, and now both tier two towers in the bottom half of the map <laughs> are going the way of MID. And with that Herald, we're going to get a little bit more damage on that mid one as well. 
Oh, he's gonna get so much damage. That's 75% of the HP. The inhib turret just gone. It's not gonna be able to regen past 33. So getting that last Rift Herald charge is so, so huge, especially as Midland, like you were talking about earlier, Although SAU are behind right now, they, if they can get to that at this point, probably like 35 or 40 minute mark, if they somehow oh, yeah. manage to get to the promised land of 45 minute game, yeah. then they are going to start outscaling. So Midland do want to keep the pressure up throughout this. And that's exactly what they're doing, cracking almost all of the bottom lane turrets now with only literally the base left on that bottom side of the map. They can start to turn their attention up towards the top side now that Baron is spawning and the fact that that top lane turret, it's there's still three of them. Yeah, definitely, definitely. One thing I would like to talk about in terms of the power swing right now is we do have that level 13 Orn coming out here for SAU. He's already upgraded his Abyssal Mask into that Infernal Mask for himself. And, uh, you know, I would like to say this is going to be a little bit more useful, but I'm looking at some of these builds right here, and uh, the items he can upgrade are few and far between. Graves right now, it looks like he is going for that Black Cleaver. However, he's only sitting at 500 gold in his inventory. It needs 800 plus the 950 uh, to upgrade that into the Black Cleaver. We have the Seraphs in the mid lane. We have a Storm Razor for the Caitlyn in that bot lane. He can't upgrade any of these items. I think what he's going to be doing next, actually, is that stopwatch for Morgana. That's not a very useful item to be up there. <laughs> no. No, it really isn't. When that's your only option, you have to go for it. We were talking earlier about Storm Razor or IE first for Caitlyn. When you have an Orn on your team, you have to go for the IE. It's just so effective. Yep. Same with this Cassiopeia. I know that she's just kind of backing at these really awkward times, but she should be looking for a Rabadons or something to try and get that Orn value as one of her ways back into the game. Because it's like 1k gold on some of these items normally. I think that's where the average normally lines out. For some of them, it's like 1200. It just starts to get insane just because you do start to approach that late game. So uh, yeah. just kind of lack of build preparation so far coming in on SAU side. But the next item for Caitlyn's probably going to be IE probably after this. I, yeah. I still don't know if it's a Lyandries because we don't know if it's been upgraded into a Haunting, guys. Yeah, um, this really Lyandries or, or Rylai's. I mean, I would like... Through, maybe there's going to be a Rabadons, but we'll see. Yeah, I would like to say, like, when you do have the ordinary team, you have to be thinking this sort of thing. Tom coming out from the Shen. Oh, uh, yeah, Tractors is in so much trouble. He's just going to walk over the Miasma. Beckles is looking for damage, but Tractors is just going to look to escape using this Blast Cone, but SAU just aren't going to let that happen. He ooh. goes down. Neko picks up another kill. The carry we were talking about in the draft phase starts to come online with this Storm Razor. Sodi Pop ooh. gets rooted up with the Orn CC as well. He's just going to go down. Those are two massive massive picks for SAU as they look to rest back control of this game. Yeah, max range on that Morgana bind. A huge pick over here from these guys, and whether or not they're actually able to capitalize on these uh, two dead right here has yet to be said. Oh, Akali's getting picked oh, off as well. Oh, the Miasma's not going to let her jump, but Scuzzrat tries to look for the angle, uses the Shuriken Flip to get over that wall. He's actually going to go right back in, uses the perfect execution to try and get some damage, but from all the way across the map, Caitlyn's going to provide some damage, and Peckles manages to dodge the five-point strike from Akali, or should I say Akali missed it, ends up walking out alive. This whole game has turned, and now Killer Guy is caught slacking yet oh. again, but it's going to instantly <laughs> liberate Nate Mac, and the play can be extended oh. to Killer Guy. You know, he hasn't really been popping off recently in this game, so maybe you forgot it, but this guy is 7-1 and one right now with a Spellbinders, one press of a button, and he's practically got, like, one more item than you think he does, and now Balloon Pants has been caught out over by these wolves. Orbit going to lock him down. Killer Guy going to pick this one up. Actually gets hit by the root. Maybe getting way too low. Balloon Pants using that magic shield to try and survive additionally. But Sandra just hasn't been able to connect with oh, one of these. Man. So Orbit is going to pick it up. Uh, I mean, all things considered, pretty okay play by Balloon oh Pants on the back end there. But uh, Sentra got really, really low in that fight. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, I think I saw the rubber banding happening on that wolf camp right there. It's just like, <laughs> wait a minute, how much damage does that do? Is that going to kill for a second? Yeah, either way, that is a 7, 1, and 3 triple item Syndra that they were fighting against. You know, Graves still only has warrior fades. The <laughs> things are a little bit rough for that guy right now. But yeah, that is the third Drake actually going to get secured over here from MITU. This is the... Uh, this is the one that brings them to Soul Point. This is a little bit more magic-resistant armor for some of their tanks, which are few and far between at the moment, mainly the Shen. But, yeah, they're really just trying to take as much control of this game as they can. Oh, fight here, top. Scuzzrat missed the five-point strike yet again, but will it even matter? Peckles manages to land just enough damage, a little bit of deja vu as the ace in the hole comes through. But that means Caitlyn's topside. And so Midland University pulled the trigger on the other side of the map. Sodi Pop 
looking for some more damage here. We were talking earlier about how Jin probably going to be one of those carries once he hits two items. He will be, but the issue is Jin does not shred through tanks very well. If there's a squishy in front of him, he will like, instantly blow him up. But if he's the one having to hit this ore and having to burn down the beefy, beefy top laner, that could be an issue. Now Neko may have been caught out. That's an insane amount of damage. This actually could be enough. Ooh. The Arcane Comet comes through. Here's the curtain call. Jin looking for the angle, and he's going to try and find it, but he does not connect. Ooh. A triple knockout from the Fleeks as well. This could be huge. Using the Scatter of the Week to try and extend this play. Here comes the Warmore. He's going to knock up Killer Guy, who has to flash away Balloon Pants. That may have bitten off a little more than they can chew. You're not Orin. You can't just walk in there and expect to walk out alive. But he does anyway. I was wrong. Sody Pop now. It looks like Midland University just trying to burn down this turret, but Cassio has enough wave clear with that Miasma with the Twin Fangs to burn oh, down that wave. But back in the middle wave, oh, there's the evolved Molten Edge. This is huge for Neko. I think Caitlyn's going to be pretty strong this fight, definitely compared to before. Now Scuzzrat and Tractors, they were trying to pull off something mid lane, but they don't have Baron buffs, so they don't just get to do that. But Midland University right now are just looking to pull SAU to the left and to the right, you know, mid to bot constantly across this map and look for chip damage on this turret spot. Peckles using that Rylai's Crystal Scepter to its full effect to extend these trades as long as possible. Orin goes back in, does end up missing the knockup, but Jin and Mor and Karma just end up walking away. Mm -hmm. Wait, this turret's still gonna go down. Ooh, is it? Ah, it is. Yeah, yeah, the minion's able to take that one down right there. A lot of damage coming out of those uh, super minions. Oh, do you have the catch out right here? Oh my god, it is. The uh. Black Shield just isn't <laughs> enough killer guy point and click. I mean, I see the damage that this champion is doing right now, and I feel like he should be playing a lot more aggressively with it. He's kind of, you know, almost proccing phase rush and then walking away a little, you know, kind of just dancing back and forth. But looking at just the value he has on his champ right now and the raw numbers, I feel like maybe he's afraid to lose his Magi stacks, but Killer Guy, he's just going to assume he's going to get outscaled by Peckle. So right now is his time to shine. And you saw it there. He wasn't even sure if that was going to kill. And through Black Shield, Neko died. Yeah, yeah, I, I have so much damage there on that uh, rank 2 Syndra ultimate right there, Unleashed Power. And what that did bring him to is 8 stat Magi stacks to 12. And what that is means he's going to get that 10% move speed bonus. Going to have a lot more repositioning tools here in these fights. Oh, we do see some kind of catch out here in the top lane. Peckles does get hit by the slow, but here's Nate Mac. Killer Guy in orbit may look to turn. Peckles gets hit by the Dark Shield. I mean, Black Shield. Uh -huh. It's just going to be able to walk away. You can't scatter through that very easily. Orbits does get slowed down, so the Karma Initiation is stopped just a little bit, but Killer Guy may be looking to keep taking this play forward. Tractors as well is looking for an angle. Try and hit somebody with that Shen taunt, and three people are stacked in this bush, and he seems to know it. He's playing so, so carefully. Killer Guy is the one you've got to watch, though. Here's the angle. The scatter is just up, and that goes Beckles and oh Ooh. that shield was enough this time Beckles is running with just one health the dark uh. shield is going to be enough he's going to get taken down now Akali's looking to take down Balloon Pants but it's Sody Pop who picks up the kill Tractors with another great taunt he's just going to keep delivering more and more value to his team but yeah Killer Guy just gets sped up by Karma and what are you supposed to do about this Syndra I mean everybody but Orn pretty much gets one shot yeah, you know, I would say try to go for some uh, really aggressive dive, CC her, and then bring her health bar to zero. You know, just simply kill the Syndra, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. You know, I, I say that, but she is, she doesn't have any health, any resistances of any kind for himself. All she has is uh, move speed with her kit. Well, unfortunately, they don't really have any strong dive. I mean, aside from technically the Orn, maybe she'll get by Morgana, I think. But with this Baron buff now taken uh, on the side of MIDU, the chances to come back into this game are like few and far between uh, for SAU. And Soul Drake is up in 20 seconds, and you can already see Midland University are just running it to that pit right now. Graze is in the vicinity, but he's going to be spotted by Wards if he walks up after he takes this blue buff. He is two levels down on Shen right now, and I don't think he's close enough in the XP to even get it off this Grom. So he is going to be pretty far away from Smite range. There's going to have to be a miracle play from SAU to get in this game. Killer Guy's level 16! I, I swear, this Graves has been on, building this Black Cleaver oh, for no, the past, like, 15 fans. minutes. There uh -oh. goes Morgana, it's just going to be eviscerated. Killer Guy didn't even have to use ult. The Unleashed Power is still up, and you can see Nico, Nate Mac, and Peckles all respecting that. Defleegs is on the other side. He's uh, He's got the right angle for the Ornhorn, though, but his team just isn't there. They're not looking for the fight yet. He was too aggressive too early. Defleegs is just going to get taken down, and it might take four members of Midland University, but he is going to be defeated by Tractors. Finally goes down. Scuzzrat's looking to just push even farther, but the soul is up. Midland may look for that. No, they just want to end the game. The Stand United's going to come through right 
right in the middle of the enemy team. Nate Mac gets bursted down. Here's the curtain call, looking for some extra pick damage onto Nico. Does get tagged up. Here's the fourth shot. Does not connect. Tractors may be low and Ooh. gets taken down by Nico. Pardon me, Peckles, who's looking to do even more here. Solo health, but the Twin Fangs is going to keep him alive enough. Just 100 health, the Black Shield, but it's not enough. Killer Guy just starts fierce right through that. Jin gets caught out. He deals enough damage. No, Nate Mac gets taken down as well. Killer Guy now is going to try and do something, but this Karma speed up. Wound Pants is just so low. Unleashed power just goes down. Oh. The Scatter of the Week just goes down. He has Flash. He can look to extend this. Nate Mac is so low, but Killer Guy just wants to end this game. You can see they had Soul Dragon up. They could have taken this game nice and clean, but they just want it over with. They want to go to game two before this game even crests the 35 minute mark. Killer Guy and Orbit are trying to take on the second turret. They have two cannon minions who are just barreling down on this thing, but Defleeks decides to look for the play. Now out comes the Ornhorn. The second way, he's not going to connect, but he successfully gets Killer Guy and Orbit out of his own base. But they could just be going for the Soul Dragon yet again. They could be forcing SAU to take these fights time and time again when they just don't win them. Yeah, Teleport coming out uh, over here for this Akali. Going into that bottom lane, it looks like. And is Syndra looking to solo this by herself? I'm not entirely sure. She has Shen coming. I'm not entirely sure what the play here is. I don't think she has the mana, but Orn doesn't want this to happen. That's for sure. He's going to TP into the pit. Tractors tries to get a taunt, but it does not successfully connect. Killer Guy has his mana again. They can honestly, yeah. Eat. There's a red buff in that pit, though. Uh... Oh, Scuzzrat somehow managed to find a flank around the other side to Fleeks, using that Billow's Breath to get so much damage. And here's the Mountain Soul. Now with the Karma Shields, it just seems like Midland, you are unkillable. Born has to flash to the other side of the blue buff, but Midland, you have the inside track into SAU's own base. They're going to start pushing this in. I think they even still have... No, they don't have... Karma still has Baron. She can escort these in. I mean, it just wear it off now, but... With the super minions as well, this could be a very big opportunity for Midland U to just look to wrap this oh. thing up. Killer Guy finds a solo kill, and down goes Balloon Pants as well. The Fiends gets taken down by Scuzzman all across their own base. SAU are just being obliterated, and their Nexus is wide open. Only one, one almost destroyed turret that can be just blown over with a gust of wind stands to stop it. Heckles and Neko were the carries for this team the whole game, and now they're in a 2v5 situation. They have to look for something. The cleanse comes out from Peckles. He's just trying to make sure that he can survive this fight. But if he can't make a play happen right now, the Petrified Gaze does not connect. He's almost getting defeated in his own in, uh. order, in his own base. <laughs> and the Scatter of the Week is going to be enough damage. Here's the final shot of the curtain shot. Cool. No. That go. Uh. Wait a second. <laughs> Killer guy just goes in. And now, at this point, you guys are just trolling. Don't ruin your KDAs. Wrap it up. <laughs> Game goes over to Midland University. 26 to 12. Oh boy, you know, this game, it was sure one that was very fun to watch uh, for the spectators. Not so much if you're a fan of St. Ambrose University, University fighting bees, but boy, this, I, I want to say the story behind this one was really a lot more individual skill just available for most of these players. You know, in no universe does Shen win the Graves matchup there in that jungle killer guy just coming up absolutely huge both in the lane and in every single team fight here on that syndra i believe when he hit that spellbinder button when he did have his uh death gap he was at about 1050 uh on his ap about 950 without it but honestly an insane amount of power coming out of these guys they looked unstoppable in every single matchup maybe scuzz rat looked a little bit rough there in the top lane right there but we saw the lanes on the side of uh, St. Ambrose not really winning where we did expect them to. They, uh, it just seemed like they didn't have the correct resources that they should have been working with this game. Producer Jordan, could you pull up the damage charts real quick? And we were talking about just how- um, Oh my God. <laughs> how Killer Guy popped off this game. Look at this graph, 35,000 damage. That is more substantially more than double the maximum amount of damage on the enemy team, which was Cassiopeia at 14k. So Killer Guy just rolled this game. Everything was looking good for his Syndra, which I expect, especially now that I believe SAU are going to be on the blue side, they're going to look to ban because this cannot make it through. <laughs> yeah, that is probably going to be the play here for us, San Ambrose University. But even if you do ban... That Syndra right there. There's just so many similar champions, you know, medium range mages that he can go into and really just keep dominating on this kind of a play style. You know, this isn't even technically that winning of a matchup 
uh, for Syndra against the Cassia Pia. There's so many better champions. Uh, Oriana, or even like some of the artillery mages that are coming back to the meta, like Xerath, Ziggs, that can do so much more work against the Cassia Pia here. This, this, this honestly just looked like lane difference here for the side of Midland University. These guys were looking awesome here, both in every single lane matchup, in their macro, on uh, their team fighting. These guys were epic. They. I could have put it better myself, Danielson. I think is the exact <laughs> word I would have gone for as well. But before we go into a short break, before Game 2 happens, do you think that Midland University are going to take this series 2-0, or do you think the Fighting Bees may have something up their sleeves? You know, if they do have something up their sleeves, we certainly did not see it here in Game 1. I'm not, say I'm not, saying, I'm not saying they don't have anything. But this would definitely be the time to start pulling that out right here. You know, any kind of cheese pick, any kind of weird strategy they can use to get the upper edge uh, against Midland University. Game two is definitely the time to pull that out in a best of three. Yeah, if we don't see some serious changes from SAU this next game, it is going to pretty much be a clean 2-0, but we are going to head into that break I was just talking about. So do not go anywhere. Don't close your browser. We will be right back. Brisk, chilling air is calling, and out there we're free to run and jump and live so wildly. Head first, we'll go tumbling through places unknown with nothing but the stars to light our way. And though the sun may set at night, tomorrow. Look so bright, cause home, home is when you're by my side. No matter what we do, together we'll see it through. And I hope that we won't drift apart, even though things change. Without you, it's not the same. I know it's true. Life's better when it's me and you. 
<laughs> Welcome, gamers, to Midland University Esports. Lecce and Danielson are back on the cast as we're getting into game two. Daniel, how did you feel about today's game? <laughs> uh, this is awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I mean... I don't want to say it felt so one-sided, but it just felt like Midland University Warriors had control at every single opportunity here uh, in this series. You know, they were winning lanes. They really shouldn't have been winning. They were controlling the jungle, even though they shouldn't have. Uh, they were winning feed fights pretty handedly. There were very few opportunities where it looked like St. Ambrose University had the upper hand. There was that one dragon that they probably shouldn't have gotten, and there was that uh, Baron, which I an opportunity to take Baron uh, for themselves. They weren't able to get it, but... You know, they could have potentially gotten it. They There are some opportunities to come back in this series, I will say. There are, and now we see SAU sticking with a familiar ban. Hecarim is off the table, but that being said, Akali, even though it wasn't wrecking havoc uh, last game, this time it is instantly off the table. They do not want to see Scuzz right on that pick again. Definitely. You know, honestly, there are better bans, I will say. that. The Akali, she was pretty good there in the top lane, especially against that Orn, but the Orn's being banned out also. But I really don't think she was doing too much for that team. I've seen Akali's pop off, and that was certainly not an Akali popping off. You know, honestly, if he went for something like the Mordekaiser, which is also banned, or something like uh, Quinn or Darius, any other lane dominant pick, I think that the could done a little bit more that kind of series. So I'm interested to see what we have. We actually have the Shen and the Nidalee being picked up here for the first two, and now the Shen is on the other foot. Yeah, the Shen now picked up first pick by SAU. A lot of priority in this series. Last time Midland picked it up first B1. But Nidalee as the response, the, one of the stronger AP junglers, but definitely one of the mm. ones that are harder to pilot. Definitely. You know, Nidalee is a very difficult champion to actually play right here. Tractors was doing a lot of work uh, that first game on his Shen. So whether or not those skills carry over to a high uh, inputs per second, or what's the word for that? What am I looking for? APM. APM. Yeah, yeah. Amps per minute. That's it. At high APM, uh, multi clear, fast clearing. Not 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 too like actually difficult like abilities to kind of use. Like maybe it's hard landing the spear, but it, she is a very difficult champion to pilot. Both planning how you want to tackle a game, tracking the enemy jungle, and basically being stronger until that late game where you do fall off. But the Thresh is going to be the pickup, and the Leona picked into the Thresh. Am I seeing this correct? It doesn't make the most sense, but trust them, Danielson. They've got a plan. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> uh, definitely, kind of counterpicked yourself there, but why don't you explain why it's a counterpick for the for the for the boys at home? Uh, Leona wants to go in, and Thresh just kind of flays her in the middle of all that, and it's kind of yikes. You try and lock down one person, Thresh just lanterns them, and he's longer range. Thresh is just like kind of Leona, but better, but also against her really well. It, it, it just doesn't feel good. But SAU doesn't Beautiful. pick up any of their ADCs, decide to pick up the Volibear Bear in the jungle, and MU, seeing three Ooh. tanks, they respond with Vayne, a real spicy AD pick. Oh yeah, Vayne. Uh, definitely not the pick to be blind picking so much here, but I guess when they see that they have the Thresh into the Leona, and they have those tanks that they're going to have to shred through, they're thinking, alright, Vayne doesn't look too bad right here. I think that if I'm SAU, you know, I'm considering my options, you know. Ash is still up and very good into that Vayne. Even if I'm feeling a little spicy, I can go for something like a Draven or a Lucian to really dominate. Uh, something like this game. I even think Draven, if you can play it, would be very, very good into this kind of a matchup uh, right here. You know, just dodge the Thresh Hook and then auto win the land. You can even see two AD carry bands being coming out from MU. Caitlyn and Ash, both very, very good picks in the lane. If they pick up something like a Senna or a Jin, I think this should be a free lane for MU, though. It, it should. Now, also, you can think maybe the Vayne is... You know, it doesn't really feel too good into Shen. Maybe they might flex it mid if they see a Galio, that famous counter matchup. But uh, I oh, say yeah. you're probably going to be picking DPS in the mid. I doubt they're going to be going for a full. Uh, I guess the only real thing that can make sense here would be maybe like a Kog'Ma comp. You got to uh, get Caitlin the Brawler's Ash. bonus, dude. Come on. Oh, you're so right, dude. It's all coming <laughs> together. MU decide they just want to obliterate anybody they go against. Picking Renekton into Shen. Uh, can be big if it doesn't go well for the Renekton early. You know, Shen can just kind of 
outplay him with those auto attacks, but at the same time, Renekton should have more priority, and we have seen Renekton mid from MU before. So okay. if that does end up happening, they, you know, are flexing this pick around, kind of putting SAU in an awkward situation as they pick up the Varus. You were talking earlier about how Varus is coming back into the meta. Ooh, yeah, definitely a very interesting pickup here uh, for SA, you know, Varus. Basically, the reason stop, people stopped picking is he got another nerf to his Q. They made that lethality build a little bit worse. However, he still auto attacks. He still has his ultimate. He still has the greediest wounds there and definitely gets some priority in this land. Of course, doesn't have any dashes to uh, get away from that Thresh, Natalie Renekton, and all that dive uh, associated with the side of Emu. With the Oriana picked up for the mid lane right here, I'm wondering, what is the counter pick here for Emu? As it's going to be the Pog. Ooh, yeah! Can we get Ooh. some Pogmas in the chat? That, yeah, that Pog is... mid. It's actually looking like right here. I assume it's not the main into the Orion, yeah, but this, this I'm excited. Mid, I, he's so good into control mages because he just deals more damage than them and outranges them as soon as he starts to rank up that ultimate and get a lot of AP. Uh, once his tier stacks, you know, once he gets some of those just standard high damage AP items. So I'm actually really excited to see this coming out from Midland. I'm a huge fan of the Kog'Maw mid. If this was a Vayne mid, not only would it just be objectively worse, but it'd also break my heart. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. You never want to... Don't go break in uh, Leche's heart over here, uh, is what my advice is for this one. But yeah, Kog'Maw mid. Mm, what a spicy pick right here. You know, he goes that uh, Seraphs. You can go that Death Cap second item i think that's probably the most efficient kind of the pick right there but there are other items you could go as well and as an artillery mage you know he's going to be very very useful in it's kind of these uh mid-range sort of control-ish mages that we see being blind picked all the time right here it's why you see picks like xerath and zig slowly coming back into the meta uh for a lot of competitive teams right here but yeah kogma it's so much stronger every single rank he gets in his ultimate can put out so much damage from such a high range and you know they really don't have that good of long range initiation to sort of counter it on the side of sau maybe if they get a flank with the leona volley bear or if they walk way too far up uh, against the Varus, they could find the opportunity to get out of the kagwa but this looks like a very safe pick in a very good team composition right here yeah i think it is difficult for SAU, I completely agree with you getting these fights, but I think a lot of it's really going to be relying on the Leona ult, because mm -hmm. Vala Bear is going to be really hard for him to walk into Thresh and Vayne, because he's one of those champs where if he manages to get onto you, yeah, he, he will just kind of punch you real good. But the oh, issue yeah. with Vala Bear is into champions like Vayne or, um, or Ash or even Thresh, it's really hard for him to walk at them because they will just flay him, slow him, not let him get on you. And in Volibear, the only way for him to really find that access is literally walk at you. Yep. So MU, as long as they can keep this Volibear at bay, there isn't really a good Orianna ults target. There really isn't a good Shen ults target. So SAU, I think, are going to be relying very heavily on this Leona to find big ultimates, to find big... Uh, sunlight swords to get into the back line. And I think a lot of the team fights are going to kind of be decided by that as we have confirmation in the draft now, unless Killer Guy and Sodi Pop end up swapping, that this is going to be the Kogma mid. I love this pick. Mm, definitely. Like you, like I said earlier, it's going to do a lot of work here into the Orna, a lot of very safe scaling, and should just be able to farm kind of for free this kind of matchup. He might see some resistance, you know, with those random QWs we sometimes see on the Orna, but you know, I, I like the draft here from both teams, but I'm just wondering, how are SAU going to come back in this one? I think if I'm them, the real play is to try to take advantage of sort of the lack of frontline that we have on the side of MU. You know, you look at the Renekton, you look at the, I mean, kind of the Thresh, I guess, and that's really the only thing stopping them from getting uh, to those hyper squishy carries, both in the Nidalee, Kog'Ma, Vayne, basically the center of the draft right here. If Renekton maybe goes a little bit Papega with his build, we see him going for something like the uh, Blade of the Rune King, as is very common right there, into maybe a Tiamat, into a uh, Death's Dance. He's working with basically zero defensive stats and zero HP. If he messes up there, we could see him uh, blowing up very, very fast in these fights and then having an easy time getting onto the back line uh, for SAU. Hopefully his team is saying, look, you need to just build that Black Cleaver into full tank. That's what we need from you. But, you know, I'm not in the comms right now. Are you in the comms right now, Leche? I can confirm that I'm not in the comms, Dane. 
Well, that, with that confirmation, I will say that we don't know what's going through their minds, and we don't know <laughs> that Renekton uh, will be going uh, tanky boy build that we are hoping he builds. Either way, this is look like an exciting game two of potential three game series, wouldn't you say? I really would, and you know, as excited as I am to get into it. Riot doesn't want us to. We still have two and a half minutes on that spectator delay. So we are going to be hopping over to a quick intermission. We will be right back as soon as the game is up and going.
Brain and Pimps and Players, it's your boy Brofresco here, and today on the desk we have Leche and Danielson again for a game two. Last game, uh, it was Midland University who took a pretty decisive win, and this time they are gearing up in this draft with the mid Kogma in Italy in the jungle, trying to style a little bit more on their opponents this time. Oh yeah, definitely. When you have uh, sort of a winning jungle player match up you kind of try to look to put as much power on that kind of thing as possible you know we had the shen into the graves this time now we have the nidalee into a tank volibear kind of matchup the 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 upper ceiling for this kind of a matchup is much higher uh than previous you can go around taking every single camp away from the bear you know the uh mm. cheetah will win that one and uh this is looking very good i don't know about the conqueror though you know about that I have seen it before because you can proc it pretty easily because Nidalee has so many abilities at her disposal and she can go melee. But mm. uh, I've definitely seen more of pretty much most other keystones, even Guardian. But Conqueror I like Dark has Harvest. been Dark. Har oh, I think we all like Dark Harvest here. <laughs> uh, but you know, Conqueror is a more brawly. Um, skirmishy kind of build, right? You're going to want to be constantly fighting, duking it out. And if you manage to proc it, you do pretty much continue to win these extended trades, even against Vala Bear. Because uh, he doesn't start to win the trades against you until like, I want to say like 8 seconds once he gets to that second Q. So, especially early on, Nidalee can abuse this. But we're going to have to see he's probably going to go for these single target camps first and then clear back down and try and maybe invade the Vala Bear, see if she can get double scuttle or just trade one. But both these junglers, I think especially Nidalee, is going to want to play through top here because she does have the Renekton, and if that Renekton isn't played through early, it is just kind of a uh, bit of a yikes, why did you draft this? Especially yeah. when the other two picks that you do have are literally going to be waiting until like level 11, level 16. Oh, I completely agree. Uh, like you said, we are going to be seeing uh, Nidalee playing Super Smash Brothers Brawl uh, here for this one. You know, she's going to be looking for this. She's going for a full clear. It actually looks like trying to get as much power off of the map as possible. Really just take it all for herself. So we do have a ward actually coming out there for that Orion. And the level 2 coming out as well for the bot lane of MIGU. But nothing's really going to happen there. The ward in the jungle is actually what I'm the most excited about. They are going to spot out that Nidalee. They're going to see, hey... Going for the full clear. Maybe we can make something happen. We'll have yet to see. Yeah, uh, Volibear now has complete knowledge on where this Nidalee is, and you can see if Nidalee doesn't uh, go for a more intelligent clear. This is kind of the situation she's put in, where not only is she lower health than the Volibear, but she is substantially behind him just in terms of camps cleared as well. He's already coming out of his jungle after clean Krugs. She's still hitting red buff. She is like at half his health. He feels just so good. This is actually really good early on for the Volibear, and now he knows that she was in the top side of her jungle, and if Orianna manages to push, he may look for a play there, but instead, he's kind of hovering his Renekton until the Scuttle Crab comes up, but Tractors may look Ooh. to contest it. Yeah, yeah, I think we might see a fight over here at that Scuttle Crab. Volibear kind of going, uh... I don't want to say bitch mode, but that's kind of what he's doing, just giving up the <laughs> Scuttle Crab, I guess. He doesn't have Pryo in his lanes, but... Yeah, this is looking like Nidalee's skull crap right here. A little bit unfortunate for my man on the bear. It is, because as Vala Bear, I, I think that Nidalee outduels you, and you should have a pushing lane at least mid, but uh, Tractors is just abusing this bear <laughs> so hard. I don't even think. Did she even taken the scuttle crab he gets, or did she just she just wanted to hit on him a little bit? She just yeah, to call my out. man Tractors the Russian circus over here, the way he's abusing his bears. This is just uh... brutal. <laughs> <laughs> and now. Oh, hold up. Beckles may have overextended just a little bit. Gets oh. hit by that Nidalee star. What was that hitbox? And Fall Bear does get his top crab, but Tractors guns it to the bottom side of the map to take one down there. A lot of just kind of fiesta plays so far this game for both jungles. They both just kind of stood there staring at each other. Yeah, I completely agree. Oh, Skuzzred actually lot. is keeping Shen outside of his field right now. So Skuzzred, all of his autos are going to go through. Conquer is proc for Renekton, and the Q heal might just be enough, but he flashes Ooh. the auto attack. First blood goes over to Skuzzred. Big play over here, right, Acton? I was even going to say, like, it really looked like Shen was getting the better half of a lot of these trades early in the top lane. He was, like, two-thirds HP, and Renekton was, like, one-third HP, basically. But we have Nidalee coming here in the bot side. She's looking for something now. Manages to connect with that, that death sentence orbit. Great oh. hook from him, and Balloon Pants gets really low. Manages to burn the Leona's Flash, so an already bad matchup. She gets caught by Hook. She's pretty much dead if she doesn't back here. And Dragon is coming up. Nidalee can look for this. But she's just going to path over to her Gromp. Take her time. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's very important to be stronger at basically like three or four camps up on the enemy jungle at every single instance for that nail lead. Now I'm looking at the builds right here. I do see the vamp scepter coming out over here for that Renekton. He, it does give him a lot of power with that blade of the rune king with that cutlass passive there in lane as well as all the sustain you get both from that and the coal that he did decide to build. But that's still a little uh you got a front line for your team eventually, man. Why not go for that uh, big boy uh, Black Cleaver? Either way, cool sh cool taunt there from the chef, I will say. Yeah, the Bork is going to let uh, Renekton pretty much roll this lane, right? But theoretically, that should be happening no matter what. And then, yep. you know, Defleegs is just going to have more global presence with the State United. So seeing Scuzzret all in on that aspect, you know, if he manages to go like 4-0 coming out of lane, you know, there could be a reason at the end of the day, because he's just obliterating the fleeks. But if that doesn't happen, then I completely agree. The fleeks just eventually outscales, provides more value to his team. Uh, he's currently out farming Renekton, so that's kind of crazy. Uh, and kinda without cringe. even having to use the stage, really cringe. And without having to <laughs> use the stage United, it seems like SE are going to get the first dragon of the game completely opposite from uh -oh. last time. But they were struggling to get any early pressure. Here comes Tractors to Fleeks. Does use that taunt to get himself out of there. Scuzzrad just calling down this wave and manages to take the first turret plate of the game. Yeah, and I got to say, with that, uh, with that tier two kind of uh, invade there from the Nidalee, this is no longer going to be a Shen out farming the Renekton. He does not have teleport. All these waves of minions are just dying to the tower. And you can even see 48 to 42 right now here for this top lane. Second tower plane is about to go down here for the Renekton. And yeah, you basically stop winning this matchup this kind of point as Shen. He has a very strong level one, uh, fierce three levels, but no, nah, Renekton's going to be a big boy after this one. Yeah, especially when the Dominus uh, does get leveled up here with the level six. He, I mean, Renekton, he's just going to be winning every single fight. Now level up on Defleegs as well. And two turret plates. Once he backs, he's going to have so much gold to be able to utilize. And Volibear, still level 5. He's probably going to look for 6 before he looks for any kind of crazy turret dive. But Kog'Ma maybe looks to take a few of these Ooh. Raptors as he just keeps getting this push into Orianna. Not something I expected to see, but it is happening so far. Killer Guy, you know, he hasn't already killed his laner. Like, that's what happened last game. Yep. But that being said, he is still one of the star players on this Midland roster and a very nice trade for Defleeks. That actually is going to be huge, as he might be able to do it even more. Scuzzrat tries to stun up the Shen and manages to return fire on what initially was a really bad trade. Now that Renekton has extended it, they're rocking about the same health. Yeah, yeah, people really don't realize just how much of Renekton's damage, uh, both from his Q, is in his auto attack, or not, uh, is in his auto attacks, both uh, from his regular attacks, just stacking up that rage, and in his empowered W. If you can get a good taunt right there, you can actually heavy win a trade, even when from behind uh, as Shen on that Renekton. Renekton is working right now with about 1,400 gold. He needs about, I think, 1,200 or 900, I think, uh, to get that upgraded cut list right now. Oh, fight here in the bot lane, though. Hard with the double flame. There's a condemn as well as this guy, Neko. He's just going to go down highest ranked player on his team. And the Dream Victory player. You know, this is the guy you wanted to play through, but just didn't oh. happen. Meanwhile, on the top side, something went wrong. Tractors isn't there anymore. And Scuzzrat, yet again, this guy plays so good. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. He was playing a little bit too far up on this kind of a lane dominant pick. And with the Volley Bear and the Clock Lady both coming up there into that top lane, he is not going to be winning that 1v3. He will be coming back to lane with both that Bilge Water and a Double Dagger, getting even more auto attacks, getting that 100 magic damage passive if you choose to use it in an all-in. I gotta say, as for Nectin, I would try to do a little bit more wave management right now. Try to get that pushing over to your side and try to keep Shen off of that wave. He does have that uh, Bonnie Cinder, which should be naturally pushing. The problem is Scuzzrat just consistently shoving the tower every opportunity you get. You should be setting up a freeze, my man. Watch some Solar Renekton only videos. You'll get it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Solar Renekton is bald after all, so do we really trust him? <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Solar Renekton only ball joke. Uh, that ch check is now on my yeah. caster list. What is this, Yeezus Twitter? Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a short amount of time that I think he followed me, and then and he got too oh, big. Oh, really? Damn. It, it was like, hold I think on. it was on accident. I, I want to hear about this. I think it was on accident. I added him as like, and I did some meme, like some tweets. It's uh, I think it was like the same way that I got followed by Vulcan, where I was like, someone said, at a famous person who you want to follow you on Twitter. 
I added, oh. I added like Vulcan and I added Jesus in like a different one, and they followed me for like or Jesus followed me for like half a day. Vulcan, I've got yeah. that one. So <laughs> you started the song, the type of content you retweet. It's just like these memes are not powerful enough for me. <laughs> no, I found the follow. Oh, Thresher? No, I'm not gonna lie oh, here. Not gonna connect. Ooh, oh, hold up. Shockwave does. Killer guy flashes out and takes the lantern. He's gonna walk out perfectly fine. Or is he in? Goes Leona. The flay's going to stop her from accelerating, but the killer guy still gets taken down. And Balloon Pants, he's just carrying this fight. Every single CC on the enemy team is being provided by this Leona. Nate Mac hasn't been able to get in yet. Meanwhile, back in the top lane, Renekton and Shen just whacking each other as they normally do. Scuzzerat yeah. doesn't manage to get the Fury Q, but still returns some damage. But Shen just with those. Oh, Ooh. Orbit managed to land the Death Sentence. There's a Flay as well. The Oriana Ball is on Leona, but no Shockwave this time. And Balloon Pants, who was carrying so hard, is going to be taken down. Now Scuzzerat almost went for that yet again. But the Fleegs may have talked pretty soon. This could go the other way. Scuzzerat's trying to abuse this Dominus, get as much health as he can from it. And he's just going to flash right onto Shen, but Shen has taunt. Uh -oh. Scuzzerat's just going to die under turret uh -oh. here, and a massive shield from the fleets. The Spirit Sword is enough to save him this time. And what earlier was a matchup that Scuzzerat was dominating, just backhanding this Shen every other minute. Now he's flashing under turret into his own. Yeah, the thing about this kind of a top lane matchup is you are the Renekton, right? You do have a lot of power. Uh, to that kind of a pick early, but at the same time, Rene Shen just has like all the answers for everything that you could possibly do right here. The one way you do just get like an auto win kind of all in is with that ultimate, the Dominus, 40 match games per second Ooh, wave. Togmon gets hit by the Shockwave and Oriana seems to extend this, just a little more of the Flash, Woo! Command Attack, and Dissonance are enough. Kog'Maw's gonna try and push out this wave, get some CS with is just a little Akathian and suicide bomb move, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just not enough. A great solo kill coming out from the mid laner of SAU. Yeah, pretty epic stuff here for the mid lane, but, yeah, back to the top lane here. Oh, we might see actually the Rift coming out. I don't get a chance to talk right here. Are we going to see coming out of all in? Now, it looks like they're just so. teams to stop are, Oh, wait, but Nidalee just went so far Ooh. forward, and Nate Mac just returns the okay. fire. Oriana now is just heading out so much damage. Beckles gets that kill in her pocket. Like you said, here's Shen with the stand. The United Dragon is an up right now, but they're looking at bot lane. They may be looking for this Scuttle Crab as well. They're just trying to get as much on the bottom side of the map as they can right now. Vayne and Thresh. Thresh is positioned back. He knows that if Vayne is in trouble, he's going to have to lantern her out pretty substantially far away. Now the killer guy, he's back in lane after that earlier death, looking for something onto the Scuttle Crab, but none of the Arcane Barrages connect. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Really interesting stuff right over here. And I got to say, Scuzz Rat is looking very rough. Uh, on this Renekton pick. You know, he was playing that Akali game one. He played it pretty well, but I think he did have a solo death there and what's basically a winning matchup against the Orn. He's really not playing this kind of a lane dominant pick exactly how he said, you know, he's shoving the lane to tower every opportunity to get. He's really not interested in keeping the CS down here on the Shen and making him a non-factor really uh without all that gold and uh, eventually he just keeps dying both in tower dives and to the enemy team ganks all right here really really rough stuff for scuzz right now shen is just a monster it looks like look at this, this. Line, just 10 to 7 damage is just Italy. insane yeah Nidalee just gets completely taken down she's gonna have to use something to transcribe here actually has to flash out but Bala Bear follows and just stuns her, takes her down. And here comes the lightning from the sky. The Fleegs picks up that kill on the Scuzzrat. We were talking earlier. This was a first pick on red side. First pick Nidalee for tractors. Uh-oh. Oh, two and one right now on that pick. I do completely agree with you. The top half of the map uh, for MIDU, it's just looking kind of cringe right now. You know, they're not winning how they should be winning. Kind of a repeat of what we saw in game one uh, from SAU. The picks that you expect to be winning are not winning uh, and they're just getting random advantages where they really shouldn't cross the map the one saving grace right now is that Vayne 3 0 and 0 does have her blade of the room king here 14 minutes in also is sitting on about 300 gold right here so she probably needs about 3,000 uh, more gold to really get that big boy Ginsu's power spike if we do see some kind of fights right here with the next dragon spawning in about two minutes I do think she has the potential to pop off, get her items, and really have the resources to carry her game right now. But this was one to four, I think. It's now it's eight to four in the style of SE. Am I correct about that? Yep. That is that's honestly kind of ridiculous. That's really not how you expect to be playing with your kind of lead and 
it honestly just looks kind of rough for most of these guys from Midland University. I really would have expected the winning matchups to win a little bit harder. I can understand Kogma dying a few times, but Nidalee consistently putting herself in places where she ends up giving away her gold lead and everything over this volley bear, really. Like, you're not actually scaling that hard on this pick. When you come to these team fights, you're going to be throwing a spear, maybe getting an attack speed boost on the vein. Volley Bear is just going to be both providing so much value with his ultimate, with his slows, with his body on the yeah, front line. This is not looking too this, good. This is an Athene's angle from Tractors, 100%. Uh, coming up in this next item, you just kind of want some of the MR so Oriana can't one-shot you, and you're pretty much playing supportive now, but Scuzzerat's going in using the Dominus. Uh -oh. This is his okay, last chance okay. to try and get an advantage in this lane, but Shen just deals so, so much damage. The stun does come through. Oh. The Renekton Q is enough damage, and the shunt down goes the way of Scuzzerat, and that means that he's Midland University are going to look for this Rift Herald. Dragon isn't up for another while, so they can still look to rotate after this, or even use this Rift Herald mid to try and get some tempo. So that top lane play coming out from Scuzzerat will be huge for Midland University if they can turn that tempo in the bottle in the form of the Rift Herald Eye here towards the mid lane. Now, it seems like Oriana may be caught in a little bit of a bind. Kog'Maw's trying to get some barrages down, but Sony Pop and Orbit have been caught out. A nice Oriana Shockwave, and now Forest just comes in with those chains of corruption and looks for another pick. Neko, nice pick from him. And now Dragon Control, which initially was looking like it was going to go Midland's way, goes right into the hands of SAU. This Rift Herald's not even going to get something onto turret. This feels so, so uh. bad for Midland U. Right after they turned around the topside matchup. You know why that happened, Danielson? It's because what? Oriana has the GLP, not Kog'Maw. And oh. with that item, everything just makes sense. I completely agree. You know, that is a pretty major power spike. It is 400 gold cheaper uh, than that Luden's Echo and only gives you 10 less AP. Very, very efficient first item for any big mage mid laner here uh, in this game. And yeah, things were looking very good for a second for MITU, but with that Renekton turning around that top lane matchup, first time he's been able to do it all game. But yeah, getting that random pick off, they were kind of just standing in that Oriana ultimate. And with the Volley Bear follow-up, it means it's going to be an easy pickoff for them and an uneven fight around the Dragon that they can't take. Second Dragon available uh, for SAU. Mi M I uh, yeah, blah. Midland did get that earlier one, but, you know, it, it, second and third Dragon are just so important for establishing tempo across the map. And it's at this time I'd like to look at who's really going to be outscaling here in this game. I do think the bottom lane will be going to the side of Midland, but... Uh, I think it's very even in the mid lane. You know, Orion is just such a powerful champion with that ultimate. Of course, you have the Kog'Ma scaling, you know, with his ultimate. But it's mainly like a 60-40 in the way of Kog'Ma. Jungle, though, 80-20 in the way of that Volley Bear. Hugely in his way. And in the top lane, definitely more a 70-30 in the way of that Shen. He's just going to be so much more useful for his team. And although they do have a little bit of a gold lead right now, ooh, Big shockwave putting up right now. I really would like to see a little bit more pickup here for mid lane before they just completely get out scaled in this kind of a matchup. And we were talking about how there was going to be, you know, an issue with uh, Oriana landing these shockwaves. She didn't have a lot of good ball delivery systems, but she just hasn't needed them because Midland has just walked into the ball every time. And when three people are yeah. sitting on, to, on the ball, you know, uh, Peckles just says, "Well, it'd be an issue if I didn't hit the R button here." And he has some team fight oh, changing up. position in here. Sody Pop has to cleanse. Use this lantern. He may be out of the fight. Peckles looks for something here. Has the sh doesn't have the shockwave, but has the GLP, and we know that's what really matters. Nidalee now trying to get some extra damage, but down goes Orbit. A nice TP flank coming out from the mid laner of SAU. Now Defleeks yet again in this top lane. He's getting pushed in. That kill earlier on to Renekton was really big for him. But it's not as if he's, you know, if this turret's ever going to go down. It's not as if Renekton's going to get anything major in this side lane. So Shen is perfectly happy just kind Ooh, of taking up. it slow. Nate Mac, he's looking for something in this mid lane. Killer guy gets lower and lower. Although he's already uh. used the ultimate, Peckles picks it up with the shockwave. Right now, the mid laner of SAE, Peckles, this guy, last game, kind of ran it. Not going to lie. Yeah. But this time on the Orianna, he's been popping off. Yeah, I can believe it. I was looking at the cooldown. I believe he was using that ultimate on cooldown. Uh, on the Kog'Maw. He just has so much setup over here. A lot of really good melee champions and dive in the Leona, in the Volley Bear, in the Shen to sort of guarantee a kill if he can ever land that Shockwave. And the Killer guy really doesn't have any kind of setup for himself in the jungle. Tractors on this Nidalee. 
You were talking about how Peckles kind of ran it game one. This is not how I expected this match, this jungle match to go uh, for the side of men. And Peckles is just looking so rough, both in the fights he's trying to take and in his farm as well against the Volley Bear. Like, Volley Bear doesn't actually have that strong of an early game, and he doesn't clear too quickly at all either. And you can even see in his build right now, he's just kind of disrespecting the Nelly, saying, I have zero magic resist in my inventory. Yeah, he was going for Swifties, honestly. That's kind of good for most junglers. It's basically the new Mobies. But uh, it just seems like Nidalee is basically going to be a non-factor this game because she wasn't able to get anything done in that early game. And it's not like she didn't have the power to work, but we have Renekton in the top lane and a Thresh in the bottom lane. But fight here in the top lane right now. Oh, the Shockwave misses, and Leona is here to try and delay Scuzzrat just a little more. Will he be able to get Ooh. the distance? No, Neck goes low. Oh, Baron is up. Work. And yeah, Baron's up. The Crocodile in the top lane is down. There's the Black Thiever you were talking about, but it's mostly for the beefy stats, right? You're not shredding armor for really anybody here. You got Nidalee and Kog'Maw, both APs. Vayne is mostly going to be dealing true damage to the frontline members, so this is looking like just he's trying to get it for the stats. His call is completed, so he's not getting any more gold off of that. Um, right now, you can see that, you know, Midland, they're kind of struggling to find a way into this game. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. Midland, I mean, you know, we talked about, we have the winning bot lane over there with that thing. She will have her Gensus in a, just a quick second right here, which will be pretty epic for shredding through all those frontline members we see on the side of SE. Whether or not she'll actually be able to, or if she gets hit by a random Orianna Shockwave in either of these fights, will it have yet to be seen? But right now, at the moment, I really would have liked to see uh, St. Ambrose go for that kind of a Baron early. They had the Renekton down. He's their only real frontline on San Medio, And the Thresh Vein weren't really planning on coming there. It kind of looked like the Volley Bear just wanted to sit mid lane, But now it looks like they're playing for this Dragon. We'll have to see how this goes. This one's going to decide the game. Leona ultimate is up, Oriana Shockwave is up, every single ult for SAU is up, they end up getting the dragon, but Orbit is looking for something, he manages to land the hook onto Shen, and here is Neko trying to get some more damage, Perk is using that phase rush to try and get out of the fight, but Orbit is looking to extend, but there's the Shockwave, and instantly St. Ambrose turn around and they start looking for more. Despite the 8 kill lead for St. Ambrose, they are even gold with Midland right now, however their real advantage comes in those 3 dragons, Infernal Soul is just 5 minutes away. Yeah, absolutely. Being able to get that third dragon means that the enemy team really has to consider their decisions, right? If the Baron is up, they have to say, all right, do we go for this and just give up an Infernal Soul? Or do we, like, uh, it, it, it's just another potential permanent objective that you really have to consider. How are we going to play around this? You know, it just affects how your team plays. It affects what they are capable of doing. And all the decisions you make right now. This is not a good spot to be in uh, for Midland University Warriors. Right now, however, we do have some pretty major power spikes right here. We saw the Ginsu's available in the last fight for that vein. Huge two item power spike there for that 80 carry. As well as the Leandris picks up there for that uh, Kog'Maw in the mid lane. I really like seeing a, a you know, Seraphs into Death Cap sort of a thing but he just decided not to this game. Leandris I actually do like a lot more on Orianna. She has the slow, she has all that damage to follow up with. But yeah, now we are 23 minutes into this game, going on 24. Baron is available, gonna have another dragon here at 325. And this is just not looking very strong for Midi right now. It's not. And Nidalee, she keeps building like she's a carry. Sis, go, go with Thines. Um, anyway, we're, that's just <laughs> my personal gripe. <laughs> but now that we've hit level 11, Kog'Maw, this living artillery is practically a screen away. Oh, uh, yeah. You can see how he's just sniping down people. And the damage isn't there yet. With this next item, like the Arabidons, he's going to be popping off. We've seen that clip of Caps when he played it back in the LEC. And, I mean, you just outrange every other character in the game and deal, like, 800 damage in ultimate. It, it, it becomes insane. Now Peck is using this Lyandries as well to clear out these waves so, so quickly. Here is mid you. They're kind of looking like they may look for a drag or Baron angle here. And I guess you've got Kog'Maw. You've got Vayne. This... This Baron would be shredded pretty, pretty quickly, but instead, they're just kind of pushing in waves, maybe looking for some poke. Yeah, I think the play here for uh, Midland would be to potentially look for a weird Baron. Go for a random pick before then, either with the Threshook or with a little bit of random damage with that Kog'Maw. And then look for that Baron. Like we said, it's going to be extremely fast to them with the AP Kog'Maw, with the Ginsu's Rageblade Vein. 
Uh, put Renekton up there to tank it. You know, he's going to have a little bit of life steal with that Blade of the Rune. But it actually looks like uh, St. Ambrose is going to be starting up this Baron. I don't think anyone knows uh, from Midland. Are they going to be able to take this one? I think Trash is in the area, but he's taking red buff. Uh -oh. They have no idea. And it's mostly because of this kind of lack of vision control. Tractor's maybe looking to put something down, but yeah, he, uh -oh. he had no idea. And I mean, Nidalee can uh -oh. get into that pit with the leap. Uh, this mid, you needs to get more on top of things in this game. Eventually, they can try and, you know, outscale before the fight even starts, use Kog'Ma to do a lot of damage before the fight. It's hard to, like, talk about this because the way for Midland University back in this game is literally on a clock. If you look at the objective timers, one and a half minutes until Infernal Soul is up. And when that does happen, Midland U, they're going to have to fight and they need to be in a good position to do that. And when the enemy team has complete control over wave state with Baron buff. It is so hard to find that initial vision control. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, not looking very good uh, for Midland right here. You know, you hope to maybe turn around and get a random fight for yourself at that final Drake. However, when they have the Baron, they just have so much more power they're working with right here. They can just go in, throw some uh, random Oriana QWs around, get like half health on either of the carries or anyone who's standing a little bit too far up right here. Kogma though, kind of doing that himself there with his ultimate, getting a lot of damage on that Oriana. However, the Oriana is 5-0-6, oh, has a full Void Staff uh, ahead of that Kogma right now. She is large and she is in charge. That is one clock you don't want to mess with right there. A lot of gold in these numbers and we have, oh, hold up. Oh, Orbit might not be able to get out of this. Uses the Flay, but doesn't hit the Blast Plane, and he is going to go down. However, that was Shockwave and Leona Ultimate. Both used just for Thrash, and we can see Sodi Pop. He wants to go into this fight. He might even look to go in for one before. The final hour is going to expire, though. He might not have the damage. This Dragon is going to be up in a matter of seconds. Watch the plays, especially around this bottom tri-bush, because that's where both these teams are probably going to try and find entrance. But no, Nate Mac, no ult. Pekis, no ult. Ba Balloon Pants, no ult. Defeats, though, does have the stand united, so if somebody manages to get in there, he can really be a nuisance. The issue is, how do you approach this condemn, this flay, this, you know, living artillery? It is so, so difficult to try and find the angle. And I say, you say, we don't want the angle. We have Baron Buff. Yeah. We'll just take your turrets. Yeah, I guess they're just saying, you know, screw going for objectives, I guess. We can just go for the real objectives. The they may have been current. flanked, though. This Kog'Maw is oh, just shredding down members. Scuzzrat may have the angle here. He uses the Bork to slow down Neko, but Neko does the exact same right back. The Living Artillery is starting to chunk out this forest. Defeegs is going to soon be grouping back up with the team. And now both squads, five on five, are reformed. Defeegs, level 16. Uh, uh, he is such a tanky boy, but a massive shockwave. But it's only on to Thresh again. That's... That feels so bad, Oriana. You gotta be, you gotta be more specific about how you shockwave at this point in the game. That means that SA, you can't look for the fights anymore. And getting that dragon there was huge for Midland. They get to delay the game five more minutes, wait out this Baron, and you know, look to make something happen on the map. Yeah, it was kind of weird the way that uh, Saint Ambrose approached that fight. They got that really good pick on the Thresh. However, they ended up taking a lot of big poke on the back end, so their front line mainly the Volibear and Leona, weren't really ready to go for any kind of a team fight. They don't really have too much reach, and they do have that one Ocean Drake. But Shen, I, I do have to say, that was kind of a failure of him. He just sat around in that mid lane. If he was able to walk up, be there for his team, be the front line that they need, and then also have his ultimate ready in case they try to go for a weird engage uh, on mid lane, they could have potentially taken that dragon and got themselves Oh, to go here he comes. Oh, the play isn't going to be able to slow him enough. Leona, as well, goes in. That Sun Sword Orbit may have been picked out, but that would cost. It connects uh -oh. again, and there goes. No, the Stage United is going to keep Volibear alive. Now, look at these Ooh. spears trying to find a pick, but a Shockwave will find two. Down goes Nidalee, down goes Sodi Pop, and now the Killer Guy uh -oh. picks up the shutdown, though. He may have the Living Artillery range. Nico and Peckless are just completely okay, but the Killer uh -oh. Guy, not a, not quite enough of a good lantern, and oh no, uh -oh. Leona oh, ends up that. following him a little bit too deep and Scuzzrack's okay Scuzzrack gets a kill and he walks out the back end alive now this entire fight is turned towards the side of Midland you can see Neko is looking for something here but Scuzzrack he should have the double dash he should also have the W and he manages to stun up Neko no matter what the hook comes through it does not connect but he's being slowed by this piercing arrow the killer guy in orbit managed to turn that fight around but it was mainly Scuzzrack who just ended up being able to stand in the middle of the enemy backliners perfectly survive take one walk out that was huge for him 
Yeah, we thought that this game was going to be Tractors playing uh, Smash Brothers Brawl uh, in that jungle right here. It turns out it's actually <laughs> Scuzzrat playing uh, Mario Kart Double Dash uh, for himself, just getting perfectly on top of all those three carries uh, of St. Ambrose and able to just completely turn around and fight that. Really looks bad. I do want to point out that Leona E really looks kind of rough on to that Kogma. She's able to... He was able to somehow buffer that Thresh Lantern where he took the Lantern, still got hit by the E, and drug that Leona well, what he, all what the way was, around that wall. Once the Leona E hits you, you're not snared in that instant. Uh, once the Leona E is completed, you're snared, and she drags herself to you. What Ooh. happened there was he gets hit by the E, and then he flashed away, and then he was snared, and then Leona followed him over the wall. So a big buffer ended up putting numbers advantage in the hands of Midland University. And as well, Scuzzrat, with that death stance, things are looking completely different from him. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, they have those stopwatches available. He can just frontline, go very, very deep in, activate his Dominus, and then just use that stopwatch, just sit there as a big threat that will be available in another two and a half seconds. And, you know, I gotta say, they are down eight kills, but they have managed to turn around this game somehow. We still do have this vein. She hasn't been looking very big in any of these team fights, but she still does have the potential. I, I, I mean, Varus does also have the potential, but he doesn't have that vein uh, silver bullets passive to really shred through that front line, as well as the threat front line to actually shred through. Varus is mainly just an ultimate bot at this point. If he can actually go for a little bit more Q center damage, I think he might have been a little bit bigger this game. You know, very low range on that uh, Nidalee and the Vayne. He could have potentially been a lot bigger if he went for that slightly nerfed uh, uh, ma uh, armor penetration build this game. It seems like he's not doing too much with his current build. Yeah, this has kind of become the Varus build of choice because the Lethality Varus has been pretty gutted since the nerfs, so this mm -hmm. is most of people go. And you know, it's kind of the Varus of old on hit, still can be a monster, but the issue is, like you said, when he is auto-attacking these fights, he has a relatively short interaction range, and Vayne is just at that point kind of him, but a tad bit better. It's now yeah. Kog'Maw is looking to use that living artillery to just poke SAU off of the Baron, and so far it's working. They're having to regroup, but they're regrouping one very specific direction down towards the fourth Infernal Dragon for them. They want this soul. Whichever team gets it, they pretty much have the advantage the rest of the game scaling me down. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. Things are looking very good uh, for the side of uh, Mid here, Midland University in this fight. So we do have another dragon available. This could mean the soul uh, for St. Ambrose. And we do have so many ultimates available. Are it's running down 1K. Uh, no, they, they don't even look to contest it now. Both teams have three dragons. This has given Midland University a way back in this game. Scuzzrat is looking for a flank as well. Baron is the next objective up. And although SAU have the inside track, Pretty easily, Midland can look for a way to kind of force him off it with the Living Artillery, with those Nidalee Spears. Orbit, though, just one QW, and he gets chunked. This Thresh is not as tanky as we normally expect him to be. He's not done with his Mikhails yet, so he's not able to reset these fights. Pe Peckless actually gets caught out. Look at this poke. I mean, this is before a fight even starts. SAU are going to have to come into this fight with a pretty sizable disadvantage. They just keep connecting. Right now, the killer guy, although he had a pretty subpar early game, I don't think we can dispute that in any way. Right now, he's been getting much stronger in this game. He has the Void Staff and the Landry's Torment, so even these tanks aren't safe from him. As the University are starting up the Baron, here comes a teleport. I believe this is from uh, this is from Shen. But, oh my god, wait a second, this is from both of them. Middle University are looking to turn this around, but Orbit and Tractors uh -oh. both get hit by the shock. Uh -oh. It might not even matter, though. 2v5, and Orbit's going to walk out scot-free. Here is Nate Mac. He gets slowed down. Living Artillery catches him in the middle of the air, and Sony Pop picks up that kill. A massive, massive misplay from SAU. May have cost them this barrel. May have cost them this game. Yeah, when you're the Orion, you know, the Shockwave is an extremely strong ability, but if you don't have really any good follow-up uh, in the area, currently you can't really go for that sort of thing. Although he's able to get a lot of damage on the carries on the side of Midland, he is not able to, to you know, walk away with his life. And what it is going to mean is a free Baron, and honestly, the past two Dragons getting very, very free. Uh, for Midland Universe. They're just working with so much power right now. They are now up in gold by 3k in this kind of a matchup. And uh, if you ask me, they're pretty going to be up in gold, up in kills uh, as well fairly soon. Yeah. Um, I mean, the fact that Midland University, one thing that I always kind of like to talk about is the kill difference compared to the gold difference. When you look at a team like 
Uh, I wanted to say C9, but first split C9. <laughs> um, RIP. They normally, for each kill they had, they would have a 1k gold lead. And when a kill is only worth 300 gold, you can really see how a team manages to take that pressure that they get off of that assassination and turn it into more. The Midland have been down kills and up gold pretty much this whole game. Now, Scuzzrat, he's got to look for something here. He double dashes, tries to get his way out, uses this stopwatch to try and extend the play, but only Nidalee is here. He ends up turning it around. This <laughs> Scuzzrat is a 1v5 right uh -oh. now. He's looking for more. He manages to double dash out. He does get taken down, though. Leona well, isn't going to be the thing that finds him, though. But you know what that does mean? That means that Leona ult isn't up for this fight. She does have to sacrifice herself to save her team, but the rest of SAU as well are routed and are having to walk back to their base. Kog'Maw's looking for more of an angle. He has the living artillery. He pokes from such a far distance now that it's level 16. I think it's literally like one and a half screens. Honestly, yeah, I think it's 3,000 range, and if you think about that, I think that's 30 Teemos, one Teemo being 100 range. So just think of it in that kind of uh, context. Now it's that all, is just now it's so all in far. perspective. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we are zoomed out a little bit here in this matchup. You know, you can do that in Spectator by hitting Control Shift C. But hey, we are into this game. We do have a lot secrets? of power. I'm, I'm not I'm not leaking anything. My lips are sealed. But uh, yeah, we are into this one right now. We do have the Baron minions shoving down that bot lane turret. I would really like to see them throw someone there into that mid lane and try to get that little bit of split in the power. And it looks like they are doing that with the Nidalee. Pickles! Jesus Christ. He's, he's literally doing that from just uh, farther than Baron minions are shooting. 3,000 right Teemos. Yeah, three, yeah. Or three, three, <laughs> yeah, no, that's not what I meant. 3,000 Teemos away, it <laughs> seems, this guy. He's just dealing so much damage. Infernal Dragon is up in a minute, but this time, this isn't a dragon that you can just give away again if you're SAU and you're not really vibing with it. This is a dragon Infernal for both teams. Mm. That, whichever team gets it, almost guaranteed to win the game. That Infernal Soul just has so much power in it, especially MDU with the Nidalee Spears, with the Vein, this Cog Mauls that just keep finding people. They're going to be dealing 300, 400 more damage. So if you are SAU, you can't give it over. And if you are MIDU, you've just gotten, what, three, dra two dragons in a row? You don't want that train to stop now. You want to keep looking. I completely agree. I completely agree. They have so many resources that they really should have been looking to take either of those past two dragons and now with this third one coming up in a sec the shem is going to taunt right here does he even win this fight under his own tower i think so i'm entirely sure though oh peckled. Ooh, peckled he stood so far up he was carrying oh. this game but not anymore and in the top side scuzzrat is abusing that so so heavily the fleegs was winning this fight so so handily earlier on but now scuzzrat's diving him under the dirt he's getting taken down scuzz mom would be proud and scuzzrat <laughs> is now going to take this top lane turret while the rest of his team takes it for him so and fall bear is looking for something here he has the ultimate oh. he can jump over the wall if he needs to uh, with the Dead Man's Plate, he doesn't really have a lot of magic resist other than just the Spear Message. He gets taken down Unlucky. and goes Thresh. The Infernal Soul damage as well is going to tick him down. Sody Pop flashes the wall. Ignite is burning, ah. and down he goes. Yeah, there it is. There it is. I want to say, I really would like to see him try to contest either of those last two dragons for his team, but it looks like the Infernal Soul is the only one that's really important to him uh, in this one. He is going to be going down. Three members actually down here uh, for St. Andros, and... Things are looking very good. You know, they're shoving down that base in multiple waves. This is looking really rough. Peckles, level 17, this shockwave, he's completed his Rabadon's death cap. If he manages to get a big shockwave here, that could change the entire game. Oh, Will yeah. he even be able to get close enough to do so? Renekton, well, honestly, at this point in the game, just double dash stun you. Peckles may have found it, gets the shockwave, but it only connects onto Ooh. Sody Pop, but that is enough. The lantern doesn't come soon enough. You can see these living artilleries, though, from 6k range away, down goes Ooh. Neko. And, oh, what is this? How is this fair? How is this fair right now? Killer Guy is just not letting the enemy team play the game. Balloon Pants goes down. You see the power of the Infernal Soul. Nate Mac gets punched Ooh. out. The killer guy is unstoppable. And Tractors is here to reclaim his good name, but no, it's looking like he's in trouble. Leona misses the E. Tractors may actually survive this. Kog'Maw as well is dealing so much damage. Lifting artilleries. Triple kill for Killer Guy. I think this is an unofficial Penta. He may be able to do it even in the base, but he flashes that mastery level seven. They take it down. Mid U were looking like they were going to lose this second game, take it to a three game series. But SAU with a critical, a critical lack of decisiveness in these last, I would say like 15 minutes, gave away three Infernal Dragons in a roll into Midland University. And that gave him Infernal Soul. And that was enough to wrap up this game. 
Yeah, you know, uh, you can't really say the same for most teams, but when you give up three dragons and a baron, that's usually enough to turn around a game. And for Midland, that's exactly what they needed to turn this one around here. Look at that damage chart. Oh my God, Kogmar, are you seeing what I'm seeing? I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing big numbers yet again. Although it took <laughs> longer to scale to the points that uh, that he got to last game. This is all in that guy. last five minutes. Like if you if, oh, yeah. <laughs> if you're looking at the first like 25 minutes of this game, it's basically the same as in Italy. That all that chunk is basically that last 30k is the last five minutes of this game. It's insane. Yeah. This I mean, killer guy. He got his three four items and he said, "Oh well, you know, yeah. level 16 as well, <laughs> 30 teamos. <laughs> I'll take that." And yeah. he just barrages down the enemy team he was literally like the ultimate is called just a living cannon he was constantly obliterating from outside of their conceivable interaction range i'm using some big words here crazy caster moment from outside like inconceivable i mean i don't think leona could even like flash flash em at that range like she would have had to flash ult to even find an angle on this guy the killer guy games one and two popped off my personal mvp this guy was a game one hard carried his team game two it took him a while but he got there yet again and sau with a crushing defeat the game was in their hands i completely agree they had the tools they should have been working with right here you know but it just ends up falling through their fingers they're not able to get either of those last three drakes they had an opportunity to go for a baron but they really weren't quick enough uh to sort of do that and unfortunately it is not unfortunately i mean Pretty epic, actually. It's going to be the two-game win uh, for Midland University in this best of three. This is, woo, this was looking very, very good for these guys right here. This is exactly what we needed. And, yeah, really, really well played by Midland. But it just kind of feel like St. Ambrose lost this one rather than Midland winning. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, SAU had the game in their hands, but... They just didn't pressure their pressure points hard enough, and that gave Midland U the chance to just wait it out, take the Dragons, and get back into this game. As that's going to be it from us tonight. Midland U take this best of three, two games versus the St. Ambrose Killer Peas. It's been a joy casting for you all. Like we said earlier, I'm Lecce, joined by Danielson, the oh, epic yeah. gamer himself. And we'll be <laughs> back next week, same time, same place.